And then with regards to your partner, here's something to think about with regards to roles. So my wife and I have had this discussion many times, and one of the discussions is, well, how are we to treat each other in public? And it isn't, her name is Tammy, the discussion isn't, how should Jordan treat Tammy in public, or how should Tammy treat Jordan? That's not the discussion. This isn't personal. It's how should a wife treat her husband, and how should a husband treat his wife? It's impersonal. And it's partly, you don't put your partner down in public. Why? Well, it's not because you're hurting that person's feelings. That's not why. It's that you're denigrating the relationship that you are in voluntarily. You know, and I've, some of the most painful days I've ever spent, one in particular I spent with a group of men who had been in therapy for their marriage and who bloody well needed it, I can tell you that. And they spent their whole day complaining about their wives. Like, it just made me sweat the whole day. I thought, I can't believe I'm here with you guys. I, I, I can't tell you why I was. It's just, you know, it was just happenstance more than anything. And I thought, how can you be so damn dumb? It's like, it's certainly possible that you married, barbar married barbarian witches. Fine, but you don't have, you, you're so lacking in sense that you would discuss that in public. Not noticing that you picked them. So basically all you're doing is holding up a sign and waving it constantly that says, I'm an idiot, I'm an idiot, right? And so, well, back to responsibility. You have a responsibility to those whom you love and are obligated to, to ensure that they manifest themselves in a manner that's most beneficial to them over the long run. Now, you have the same responsibility, I would say, to yourself, but you'll have blind spots. Other people have to help you with that. But so the rule is, you know, you don't let, you don't, you help your wife figure out how not to make a fool of herself in public. And she extends to you the same courtesy. And it's partly maintenance of the sacred nature of the relationship. It has nothing to do with you or her, precisely. It's broader and wider than that. Okay, so then that's two levels of responsibility. Child, partner, next level of responsibility. <clears throat> You're asked at your workplace to, go to undergo unconscious bias retraining. And you say yes. It's like, okay, you've just admitted that you're a bigot, right? Because you're acting it out. It's like, I'm a racist bigot. Obviously, I need to be retrained. And so you might say, well, I'm not going to make a fuss about it, right? Or I've been told to do it. Or maybe you agree with it. Fine. And if, that, if you agree with it, no problem. You can make a case for it. I think it's a weak and appalling case, personally. But you can make a case for it. You could say, well, you know, I am interested in my, uh, my biases and how to rectify them. And, like, fair enough, you know, people are biased. But if you object to it and you don't say anything, then you're complicit. And then it's on you. And, you know, like, A causes B and C, and B causes C and D, and so forth. The thing tends, it doesn't always, but it has this tendency to expand. And you'll come home angry and upset and you'll go to the training program and you'll think this is ridiculous because that is what you'll think in all likelihood and you won't say anything but it eats at you well you've abrogated your responsibility and so and then you might say well so then then that's how the community becomes corrupt that's how the community starts to be corrupt is that people turn a blind eye to emergent pathology when they know it's pathological that's exactly what the Egyptian story says Osiris is overcome by Seth because he's willfully blind. Willfully blind, which means he knows, but refuses to, he knows, quote, his predator detection systems have gone off. Monster. Well, then you're supposed to look, okay, exactly what sort of monster is this? Well, it doesn't have wings, it doesn't have a tail, you know. You cut it down into the, you cut it from the monster that it could be into the monster that it is. That's the first step. And then you take the appropriate steps. And then you also notice the other monsters, because here's something to think about. You're going to pay a price for speaking up. But you're going to pay a price for not speaking up. So it's like monsters on the right, monsters on the left. Pick the ones you want to battle with. If you decide not to make your stand, you weaken yourself. If you do it a hundred times, then even if the monster was only this big, now you're this big, it's going to eat you. You know, when it was this big, you probably could have kicked it across the room. It's too late for that. You've capitulated and capitulated. You know, and so what, what you've done, 
and this is a way to think about it from a Jungian perspective, this is what Jung was trying to get at when he was talking about al alchemy. It's like, the thing that pops up to object to you is this incredibly complex entity. It's, it's the entire world encapsulated in the event. Um, if you interact with it, you unpack it. You differentiate your sense of the world, and you, and you, you gather new skills. Let's say we're having a conversation, and it's flowing melodically, and all of a sudden I say something, and there's a disjunction, right? You're offended by it, there's some negative emotion that comes up, or, 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 or you know, maybe I've said something to impress you, or to be arrogant, and you respond badly. It's like, we've got this melodic thing going on, it's a consensual frame, and something pokes itself up to put a disjunction in the conversation. It's like, well, that's where the information is. It's like something went wrong, something didn't work out, I'm not looking at the world properly, or I don't know you well enough, or as well as I thought. There's something there, and if I have any sense, I'm going to focus my attention on that. Like, not obsessively or anything like that, but that's where all the information is. Because as long as what we're doing is working, then we both know enough already. As soon as what we're doing together isn't working, then that's instant evidence that there's something about us that needs to be updated. And you might think, well, that's a terrible thing, and the answer is, yes, of course it is, it's a terrible thing. But it's also the thing, and this is the next stage of the development of this, let's call it universal morality. It's like, the, the universal morality might be found in the answer to the question, what should you do when you make a mistake? Now, one answer is, catastrophic dissolution. That's, that's a collapse into chaos. Well, that's, no one is going to pick that voluntarily. <clears throat> Let's put it that way. It's unbelievably unpleasant. Terribly anxiety-provoking. Shameful. Uh, and painful, all at the same time. Worse, it can mean the absence of positive emotion. Because if you really collapse into chaos, not only are you overwhelmed by negative emotion, but the positive emotion system shut off, and that, that's what happens to someone who's extraordinarily depressed and also hyper-anxious at the same time. Not only are they suffering from an excess of negative emotion, but they've got no incentive movement forward whatsoever. Okay, so that's not an optimal solution, because it takes you out. The other possible, and so I would call that a nihilistic solution or a chaotic solution. It, it's not a solution, it's a dissolution. And you could think about it as a precursor to a potential solution, but it's very easy to get stuck there. And that's why Jonah could have stayed in the belly of the whale, along with all the other people that were eaten by the whale, and never got back out. And you see people like that all the time. Their error has come along, blown out their frames of reference, they've collapsed into the underworld, into the chaotic underworld, and they don't know how to get out. They have post-traumatic stress disorder, or they're depressed, or they're hyper-anxious, or, or they're, they're resentful and aggressive and, and destructive. Like, there's any number of states of being that can overwhelm you when the bottom has fallen out of your life. So, it isn't something that people are going to... It's not an optimal solution, let's put it that way. Well, the, the other... That's a nihilistic solution, a collapse. The other solution is, we're talking, and I don't get what I want from you, and so I say, you better not do that again. I don't want to see that from you again. And so that's a tyrannical attitude, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my universe of order and its predictions, and I'm going to say, you go along with this, or I'm going to punish you. And that's, that's a... Now, there is a, an element in society, like society is made up of, Threats like that to some degree. It's an ineradicable, ineradicable part of society. That would be the tyrannical aspect of the Greek king, let's say. You know, we, we've organized a set of punishments and threats that keep each of us in alignment. However, generally speaking, in a society that's functional, we've decided to adopt agreement with that set of principles more or less voluntarily. You know, we say, well, you have rights and responsibilities, and I have rights and responsibilities, and I'm willing to pay a price for yours including the acceptance of punishment if I transgress, but you're going to do the same for me. So there are, there are intelligent ways that punishment and threat can be used and bounded. So, but it, that can easily degenerate into tyranny. And one of the methods that I can choose to use if I don't want to encounter error is just to enforce my will on everyone else. And I think when that happens, 
personally and in the family and in the community and in the state all at the same time, then you get the emergence of a tyranny.